So good to have everybody on board this. So, hey, yeah. So, Willie. Is this a deflection? Of course it's a deflection. Willie. It, it, from Stormy? Well, yes, of course from <laughs> but Stormy. Who can, who can keep their <laughs> eyes off the whole Stormy situation? Certainly not from the Nor'easter. But, Willie, look, just let's look back at this week. You had Donald Trump enraged by some events earlier, uh, the leaving of Hope's, you know, Hope Hicks's announcement that she was leaving, a testimony that didn't go so well, the House Intel Committee, several other things uh, uh, crashing at the same time. And the news reports were out of the White House that the president was angry, and so he just struck out and decided to push tariffs. And he did it without talking to any of his economic advisors. He lost his most able economic advisor, Gary Cohn. And then fast forward a couple of days and the president is consumed in the story of a payoff to a porn star, uh, which now we're hearing uh, he was angry at his press secretary for right. mistakenly telling for mistakenly the truth. The truth. Oh. And suddenly you have the foreign policy community shocked and caught off guard by the most significant announcement a commander in chief could make in 2018. So tariffs and North Korea, all to distract from a president that didn't go through the proper channels or use the proper interagency uh, processes once. Well, that's exactly right. On both tariffs and this, this stunning North Korea announcement, it appears to have done in a pretty ad hoc manner. When you had the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, that we just played there, traveling in Ethiopia saying, quote, we're a long way off from even the idea of any talks with North Korea. And then a couple of hours later, the announcement at the White House by a South Korean official and confirmed by the White House that the president would meet with North Korea. Look, I mean... I sort of take the Ted Cruz view, which he said on this show a couple of days ago, which is that the president's first comments are kind of an opening bid. Now, he followed through on the tariffs. We saw those yesterday with some caveats. It remains to be seen, I think, and Andrea probably has better insight on this than me, whether or not this meeting face to face with the leader of North Korea and the president of the United States actually will come to pass or whether it's some peace in a larger negotiation with that country over its nuclear weapons. Or again, a distraction to change the headlines from Stormy Daniels, I which think, was yesterday. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what to, it is. <laughs> to North Korea today. But why don't we start with let's, major developments? Let's get to the details of this major developments and the crisis with North Korea. President Trump accepting Kim Jong Un's invitation to meet in person. The groundbreaking news comes after South Korea's National Security Advisor briefed President Trump, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, and other top officials about a recent meeting he and other top South Korean officials had earlier this week with Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang. Speaking outside the White House last night, Chung said he expressed his and South Korean President Moon Jae-in's, quote, personal gratitude for President Trump's leadership, which, quote, brought us to this juncture before going into details of the meeting. I told President, President Trump that in our meeting, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said he is committed to denuclearization. Kim pledged that North Korea will refrain from any further nuclear or missile tests. He understands that the routine joint military exercises between the Republic of Korea and the United States must continue. And he expressed his eagerness to meet President Trump as soon as possible. President Trump appreciated the briefing and said he would meet Kim Jong-un by May to achieve permanent denuclearization. Chung also said that it's important not to repeat the mistakes of the past, refer referencing North Korea's notorious history of offering to give up its nuclear weapons before ultimately breaking that promise, adding that until, quote, North Korea matches its words with concrete actions, the maximum pressure campaign will continue. In a statement, the White House says, quote, President Trump greatly appreciates the nice words of the South Korean delegation and President Moon. 
He will accept the invitation to meet with Kim Jong-un at a place and time to be determined. We look forward to the denuclearization of North Korea. In the meantime, all sanctions and maximum pressure must retain. And a senior administration official later said that the meeting will happen, quote, in a matter of a couple of months. Trump also later tweeted, quote, Kim Jong-un talked about denuclearization with the South Korean representatives, not just a freeze. Also, no missile testing by North Korea during this period of time. Great progress being made, but sanctions will remain until an agreement is reached. Meeting being planned. All right. Uh, Andrea, um We've heard that a lot of people were kept in the dark here. Rex Tillerson obviously saying what he did earlier. The Pentagon saying last night they were caught off guard. What can you tell us about how this developed and who knew what and when did they know it? Well, clearly the State Department was very much out of the loop that this was, in fact, according to a lot of people we talked to last night, an audible that the president called during the meeting with the South Koreans. I think they were all aware that there had been a lot of progress. The president teed that up on Saturday night at the gridiron, started talking about it. We knew that the North Koreans and the South Koreans had had their meeting. But the fact that he would decide to accept, almost on the spot, mm -hmm. the invitation for a meeting. Now, there were leaks that there was a letter. In fact, there was no letter. It was a verbal communication. So they were taking the word of the South Korean foreign minister, and we know that the South Korean president has been very forward-leaning and making some people in the administration a little nervous about how much he wanted this to happen. Taking their word, rather than having any kind of a, a letter or a document to parse, to have the intelligence experts uh, mm -hmm. analyze as to how how committed Kim Jong-un really is. Kim Jong-un wants legitimacy. He wants a presidential meeting. The questions that people, even those who've been yearning for talks, rather than all of the rhetoric and the insults, the taunts, the nuclear button, mine is bigger than yours, all of that, Aye. which has been a real crisis. This has been a tinderbox, rhetorically at least, threats of a preemptive nuclear strike, a bloody nose, all of this. Yes, people wanted talks, but even those who really were yearning for talks think that this is conferring legitimacy on Kim Jong-un without getting anything, even a promise to release three Americans who are still being held well, hostage. And, and again, uh, there, there was no process to this whatsoever, and no uh, no build up to it and like you said they they got absolutely no concessions for this meeting which again just proves to every dictator in the world get nuclear weapons you get legitimacy and you can actually remain a bad actor and this president at least will just take a meeting and Andrea let's talk really really briefly for for people who may not be aware of it but talk about how the North Koreans have made fools of every American president since Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, even though he then called them the evil empire, and uh, and Barack Obama, all three fooled a former president, Jimmy Carter, going in 1994 and getting fooled and misled by Kim Jong-un's father, mm -hmm. Kim Jong-il. I was there during negotiations uh, with the, the previously the highest ranking American to ever meet with a North Korean leader was Madeleine Albright. So in October of 2000, we went and they were going to normalize relations. And then George W. Bush hit the pause button on that when he was elected in March, uh, in, in March of 2001. But, 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 but they've that, all been, that, they've cheated in every instance. And even the Madeleine Albright meeting was, I, I'm sure it was not one of her favorite moments no. in, in the Clinton White House because she sat there and it ended up just being a, a propaganda show for the North Koreans. But they at least thought that they were going to normalize relations and get something for it. And then only a few years later, they discovered that he was developing a parallel program to the nuclear program so that he had not dismantled. And then Obama trading food and humanitarian aid right. and then discovering that look at the missile advances. We have our intelligence agencies deny this, but we have misread their advances year after and year. underestimated yeah. this man's brutality and mm. only this week we've confirmed that he used vx gas an illegal poison mm. to kill his stepbrother in kuala lumpur right we understand that he has been providing chemical weapons to bashir al-assad and the chinese while doing better and the russians have been cheating by resupplying him with fuel at sea yeah. so no question that part of the motivation here may be that he's trying to play our president 
at the same time, there's some speculation about the totality of Kim Jong Un's motivation. Is there also a chance that some of these sanctions yes, are absolutely. putting the squeeze on him when you have people showing up, you know, running from the borders, looking emaciated with intestinal bugs and worms well, at the border? The, I think that. What, what studies have shown is that North Koreans uh, over the past 60, 70 years are uh, several inches shorter and thinner right. than their uh, complete uh, ethnic twins, if you will, mm -hmm. in the South. They have been starved for decades and right. decades, and so that is very, very true. I think the sanctions are taking and, away. And that's the, that, that is the one thing that we've learned. I mean, sanctions. Uh, seem to be working in North Korea. Sanctions uh, were working with Iran, and it seems that too often presidents are too eager to make deals and and, and pull back from the sanctions. Look, sanctions have a mixed record. Sometimes they work. In other places, if you go all the way back to Rhodesia, it takes 20, 30 years before they have any impact. It does appear, per uh, Heidi's comment, that in this case they're working. The other thing that's going on here, and look, I spent 30 years basically doing negotiations as an investment banker, and it was sometimes helpful to have a client saying, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to blow up the world. And that's kind of what we have here. We have our own madman who right. could potentially blow up the world. You're, you're talking about Trump? Yeah, I was thinking of Trump <laughs> when I said that. And uh, and so it could have an impact on the North Koreans, saying, hey, we don't know what this guy's going to do. Let's at least see if we can get something I done with it. It could be really dangerous. There, there are, well, what could be really but, dangerous but, is if he goes in there, as he's wont to do, utterly mm -hmm. unprepared, right. unaccompanied, with no idea of what the real issues are, with none of the historical context that Andrea just uh, well, went I, I, through I was, so well. I was just going to say, I mean, what, you're right. Uh, sometimes it helps to have somebody say, I don't care what anybody did before me. This is my position. And if you don't like it, then then get ready, because I'm not going to be wringing my hands and talking to State Department lawyers. I'm just going to move. So I do understand that part of it. But what I fear, and I'm drawing no comparisons, no, no direct parallels, but what I fear with Donald Trump is what we got with Barack Obama in Iran, who in 2007, at the start of his campaign, was saying, I'm going to negotiate with the Iranians, and there are going to be no preconditions. And he thought he was going to remake the world, and he was going to be the person that could just reason with the Iranians, and we were going to be able to move beyond uh, where we've been since 1979. And I think most people, looking at it honestly, would look at that negotiation and say that Barack Obama and others in his administration were so desperate to get a deal with Iran that they got a very bad deal. And that's what I fear with Donald Trump, except at least the Obama administration had the, the, the diplomacy and the apparatus in place and were, were logical and uh, were reasoned, even even though I believe they came up with a bad deal. But Donald Trump, again, he just makes a decision on tariffs because of Hope Hicks, and he makes a decision on North Korea because of Stormy Daniels. And, and people, can, people can deny that all they want, but you, if you're doing that, you're in the tank for Donald Trump because it is painfully obvious yes, that that's so exactly what's going on. This is he wanted, pattern. you know what? He did not want the Washington Post to have the word Stormy Daniels on the front page today. Guess what? He succeeded, and he succeeded by lying about a letter that didn't even exist. Uh, and, and now he's... he's Angry at his press secretary you know, for actually confirming that there was some sort of transaction. Telling the truth. And, and, and fools rush in. His but relationship his, with the porn star is confirmed, and he doesn't want it on the front page. There's, there's no question. It's not going to go a, away. There's no question this is a high wire act, and nobody really knows what's going to happen. But to your point about preconditions, Donald Trump has already violated what he said was his requirement to have right. negotiations. He set a precondition that they had uh, denuclearized, and now that he's already walked back from that. So who uh,